Welcome to Sidecore Standard Values. In this podcast, we continuously seek to provide deeper insights into the value of Sidecore as a solution to business problems. With regular episodes from me and Amia and my friend Rick in the US, we alternate to bring you a variety of guests to share their perspectives and experiences through a rich tapestry of discussions, opinions, and thought experiments. Today, I am welcoming Martin Miles to the show. He's been working exclusively with Sidecore for over 11 years. And as he describes, he's still finding more and more amazing things to discover, study, and share with the community. He's a prolific and active member of the community. And he's, for example, the guy behind, behind the Sidecore Link project. Uh, after many years as a contractor in the UK, he just relocated to the States in sunny California. Um, so welcome, Martin, to the show. Yes, uh, hi, hi. Sultan, hi everyone. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, great to have you here. So, um, tell us, uh, how did you fall into the sidecore potion? So that was a long story of mine, and uh, I am in uh, the industry for almost twenty years. And uh, mm-hmm. as you fairly mentioned, eleven of which I spent doing sidecore projects. Probably not eleven, twelve, even twelve. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> time goes fast. Indeed. And uh, initially, I was working as the generic .NET specialist. And from time to time, I started getting the uh, contracts with Sitecore as the main platform, which mm-hmm. I initially did not like because the, I don't know, probably because of lack of documentation or because of not uh, correctly understanding the paradigm of the platform. But as soon as I start more getting involved in, into the Sitecore development, I start getting attracted to that more and more mm-hmm. and uh, the things have uh, changed indeed with the version 7 which brought lots of changes uh, then 7.2 brought even more changes and uh, the decent documentation started appearing and from that time I almost didn't take any other projects outside of Sitecore which stays valid until today. So with every major version, when it comes to version 8, with XDB, with uh, full redesign, it became, it became even more serious platform. Then uh, with version 9, they did the whole internal rework of uh, analytics. Uh, we got XDB uh, moved into through XConnect. We mm-hmm. got new way of installation. We got lots of different changes. And with version 10, we got... Uh, containers as a major, uh, I would say, as a major uh, way of provide provisioning st- infrastructure for Sitecore. Mm-hmm. And uh, it goes, it goes ahead. So Sitecore never stops with the development. And this is something that attracts me. Yeah, so, great. yeah. Yeah, yeah with, okay. with recent years, documentation went to a uh, much better level. And now, you can find almost everything there. But previously, mm-hmm. there was definitely a gap with documentation. And this is actually how one of my projects came into a play. And mm-hmm. uh, I'm now talking about Sitecore Link Project. Yeah. So <laughs> I will tell you a story behind that. Uh, initially, yeah. when I was working as a contractor in England, uh, it was uh, a very big concurrency between uh, the guys on the market to obtain every single contract and you have to prepare for the interview really really well so Mm -hmm. i started to collect and classify the valuable blocks uh, created by the community all these posts and i use them in order to prepare for these interviews so with time this uh collection uh, was published to the website and Mm -hmm. with time of progression it turned into the largest knowledge base of sitecore uh with the technical knowledge for the platform much bigger than documentation provided by those days. Yeah. So uh, that was actually the best and easiest way to learn about Mm -hmm. uh, anything like, for example, if I want to go and study about search in Sitecore, I go to the following category and I will have all these blog posts refined and pre-selected. So it's not yeah. something like artificial intelligence that does the job mm-hmm. for you. 
Uh, of course, it does everything outside of deciding that particular link goes into a particular category or if it's yeah. being dismissed. So I try mm -hmm. to avoid all the marketing noise. I, want, I only wanted to classify and collect the best links uh, about the technology. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was powered by uh, scripts. So scripts mm -hmm. were crawling the internet, scripts where every morning presenting me the list of the links to add to the uh, project. But the mm -hmm. final decision was all, always on me whether this thing goes to the uh, collection or it will be dismissed. Okay. So, so, you are like the, so, so, you, so you are like the Google of Sitecore technological knowledge. <laughs> I would say it's much bigger yeah. <laughs> exaggeration to compare me with Google, but the whole idea was initially to help people, help myself and other people to prepare for the interviews. Yeah. And then uh, I decided to make it a knowledge base for Sitecore. Yeah. Actually, there is another project done by me. Uh, it's called Awesome Sitecore. And this is part of the legendary Awesome Links. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have heard about that, if you haven't, please Google what is that. And it mm -hmm. took me three months to squeeze this uh, Sitecore knowledge into the uh, Awesome list. But what is, in fact, is a curated repository on a GitHub which, which classifies most of the open source solutions for Sitecore. Okay. And it dramatically simplifies the amount of the time uh, that required for writing the code for Sitecore. And uh, everyone can just look up for inspiration at a specific category or even just copy snippets from there. So basically, mm -hmm. if you have a uh, GitHub repository with something about Sitecore, it will likely end up in this list. Yeah. I think we'll, what, what we'll do is we'll provide links to the different projects being mentioned in the, um, in the conversation today. One of the things I wanted to touch with you is you've been a contractor for all those years um, and you've been very active. So wh what are for you, let's say, the, the best way to be successful as a contractor? So there is uh, one and the most important bit is you have to be... Uh, Tech technology perfect in terms of your knowledge. So you, sh you should be ahead of the, the rest of the crowd because at least in the United Kingdom, when I used to work and live, there was huge concurrence on the market. And mm -hmm. uh, basically when you have one contract and 15 people uh, are trying to get it, you have to be one of the 15. So yeah. to make, to achieve that point, what you should keep in mind is that uh, while taking this particular contract, you should not be driven by money, but you should mostly be driven by the opportunities which you can get mm -hmm. from this contract. So it's a, an easy way to get a contract with the, all the skills that you already have. But think about mm -hmm. what you will learn about uh, from this contract. Will you get something new? You will, definitely you will. Uh, but it's about to get in something extremely new and extremely big something that would be in demand on your next contract. Yeah. So if you manage to get a contract and manage to learn the skills there, you will uh, be more likely to get even a new contract. Mm -hmm. But again, it's, it's, it's all about thinking what you will be learning and what projects will you be working for the next six to, let's say, 12 months, rather than yeah. the amount of money you will get back into your pocket. Because as soon as you master the technologies, the money will be always with you. It's, it's not yeah. the first thing in your life you should focus at. That's for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. So you're always looking at projects that will stretch your knowledge and that will yeah. allow you to grow while doing something. So it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, you're running a new marathon. So it's like I'm running a half marathon and then I'm running a marathon and then I'm running an ultra marathon and et cetera, et cetera. Keeping pushing the boundaries so that you get stronger and better. So there is an interesting thing to mention that mm -hmm. at, at one hand side, you have to be very perfect for the position, but on the other hand side, you have to be a little bit under skill so that you can still learn something about mm -hmm. new. So yeah. you need to keep this balance. And, that, and that, that's a tough balance, I think, too. Uh, that's true. That's true. Yeah. To be able to master. Uh, what I was also interested to, to hear your thoughts about is um, you've been... You know the Psycho universe a lot. You've been working with a lot of different brands. Um, what are the three key trends 
for, according to you, to look for in the next 18 months? Um, so obviously, everyone knows we are going SaaS. Same mm -hmm. way, men's community. Uh, so the platform has moved as to SaaS, but there is still uh, the platform version of it uh, that will be developed in parallel. Mm -hmm. So it's not a uh, one-day shift. It will be. It will last for probably let's say one or two years. All this mm -hmm. switch of the paradigm. So that's the one direction. The second direction, I would say, is the um, integration and automation. So with the composable world, you have lots of systems and we are not sure if all these systems play well together, even those that have been done by the same uh, vendor. So mm -hmm. let's take X, uh, XM Cloud, for example. So as we know, it is uh, um, just a system that just been released and you may utilize content from any other CMSs. So the data source becomes universal and mm -hmm. uh, basically there's no more vendor log. Uh, but you, again, how would you integrate the systems? And this is the place where uh, security comes into your play. And I would say security is new kin because with mm -hmm. lots of integration, there will be lots of uh, potential security breaches and um, even one breach or leak or outage will put the company reputation at risk. So this should be treated very seriously. So no compromises against security. Yeah. So, so, so that, that, yeah. yeah, that was number two. Mm -hmm. And uh, number three, I would probably say that things are going into low code, no code direction. So mm -hmm. that I think that's a good thing from the business point of view. This is something that we as the companies wanted to have. But on the other hand side, there's lots of challenges uh, staying in front of big companies with lots of stuff. Like we, big, as a big companies, we have lots of uh, people who we need to retrain or retire. I don't like mm -hmm. this word. And uh, I always try to encourage best in people I'm working with. Yeah. But if, if the paradigm changes, we need uh, people to change, uh, the professionals to change along with it. Yeah. So with more, type, more typical solutions, development teams uh, are moving from like development in, in general moves from being an art, something like we treat it like an art, into a commodity. And yeah. it also could be outsourced. So I predict uh, layoffs in the technology sector because of all this uh, trend. And uh, generally, uh, I don't know, is, is it good or not to describe fear as a job security driver? But mm -hmm. I'll be honest with you, this is something that always worked with myself. So yeah. all the learning, all the progression I did in my past was uh, kind of driven by a fear of job security. So I wanted to put myself into that level of position where I would never, ever risk um, a job security factor. Mm -hmm. As a part of my yeah. story, yes. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. I. I. I, th I think we indeed look at a reskilling or a re. Uh, retraining for some skills. Uh, we also see some more flexibility. I'm not a developer myself, um, but I, I see that there is way more flexibility into languages that can be used and all the advantages that headless technologies um, provide. And so there are a lot of, I think, a lot of chances for a lot of people. And even for past technologies, uh, I recently heard about uh, some developers that still program in COBOL. And we have oh, some yeah. business critical application in the Netherlands that runs still on COBOL for some banks and for the government. So um, I did some COBOL in school a uh, long time ago. And yeah, so some technology is still are still there. So, but we'll see. The future is exciting. And I think uh, there are a lot of things yeah. that can happen. Um, yeah, that's it indeed. <laughs> and uh, remember your previous question about the uh, changes and trends. So mm -hmm. now we uh, are moving to more integrations with more integrations and uh, trend. So we, we see lots of things like infrastructure as the code mm -hmm. and uh, like automating your network and automating your environments, automating 
and provisioning and configuring your uh, lot, big largest farm of the uh, machines and uh, containers is the big thing now. So yeah. we have now big names like Terraform, Ansible that yeah. work together. Uh, so now infrastructure becomes the code. You can even uh, source control that and you can see who brings the changes, what motivates people to do these changes. Mm-hmm. You see comments in the same manner that we did with the code. Yeah. Well, K- Kubernetes alone is a big thing on its own with a big mm-hmm. shift from the way we did previously with the virtual machines and how we now yeah. orchestrate the containers. Yeah. So yeah, the industry is not standing. It's uh, accelerating, I would say. Yeah, it's greatly accelerating. So yeah, um, as you know, the, the name of the podcast is uh, Standard Value. Um, so w- what is your standard value, Martin? Um, I would say one of the good things is to be flexible. And uh, I would say this is kind of metaphor because uh, if you take a look what standard value is inside Core, um, this is the default values which you get uh populated the items with when you create an item from a template. But among these values, you may have tokens. So token is uh, something that expanded uh, dynamically based on the situation, like the date, for example, or name or something else. So I would, I would use this as metaphor just to say that you don't have to be following the same path all the way, just be flexible like the tokens. Mm. And apart from that, from that, I would say never give up because, uh, like, I've been so many times in these situations when uh, I spent a decent amount of time troubleshooting certain things, and I was literally about to give up because I spent a day on it. And guess what? In the next hour, I found a solution. So that happened to me in most cases, and uh, never mm-hmm. give up. This is for myself. This is for all of you guys. I wish you never to give up in any cases, whatever happens. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it's really key to never give up. And, um, and, uh, as, um, George Benson was singing, never give up on a good thing. Uh, I recommend that song by the way. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Martin for joining us today. I wish you all the best of luck in the U S. Um, I'm sure you'll do great. Uh, Enjoy uh, sunny California and say hello to Rick if you see him. And uh, if I'm somewhere there, I'll, I'm sure I'll, I'll give you uh, I'll give you a call. So thanks a lot for yeah, joining. Please be my guest. Thank you. Okay. Have a great day. Bye.